Um, great. Well, welcome to our community conversation on diastasis recti. Um, I think you're all here because this is a very misunderstood topic and it's something that even having training as a doula and childbirth educator and um, not like a high level of training in how the body works, but being exposed to hundreds of women who are dealing with it, I still have a lot of confusion about. Um, and when I was able to connect with Rebecca through another birth worker of ours as we've left the New York area and birth murders expanding. Um, it just felt like she really represented the birth murder ethos of bringing um, like sane thinking and simplicity to an otherwise complicated topic. So I'm really excited to hand it to you to do an intro and lead us and please ask questions throughout everybody who's here, but we will leave time for questions at the end to have it be more interactive. And Ashley, remind me how much time you want me to talk and leave for Q and A's. I think if we talk for 15 or 20 minutes and then do questions at the end, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Do you need to share slides? Do you need to be a co-host? Mm, it wouldn't hurt if I could at least share a couple of things possibly along the way. Cool. There you go. Perfect. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I'm just pulling out my slides. Hi, everybody. My name is Rebecca, and I am a pelvic floor physical therapist, and I own a clinic called Ladybird Physical Therapy, which specializes in pregnancy and postpartum. So pretty much all we do is work with pregnant people managing pregnancy pains, preparing for childbirth, recovering postpartum, and diastasis recti, particularly in recent times, I think has become like one of the hottest topics. It's what people know about, it's what people are scared of, it's what people think about preparing for pregnancy and recovering postpartum. And I think that there's a lot of fear around diastasis recti, so I'm really hoping to debunk some of that today um, and give you some actionable tips for how to move forward. Um, so just as a disclaimer, nothing that I'm going to be sharing with you today is medical advice. This is not considered physical therapy. I'm not your physical therapist and I can't provide you with personalized information and personalized answers regarding your particular body. However, I think that a lot of this general information really does apply to most people. If you have questions, feel free to stop me, just like Ashley said, and I'll try to check the chat as well along the way. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is what is diastasis recti? So just the basics, what is it? How common is it and why does it happen? As well as why it matters to you. So why it's relevant and also why it doesn't matter. So how to kind of reframe the thinking around diastasis and then also how to check yourself and how to modify movement if you feel like you might have it that allows you to continue moving safely and continues allowing you to gain and maintain strength without stressing your body in ways that might make recovery a little bit harder, um, as well as what you can do about it. So just starting with what diastasis recti is, for those of you who I can see, can I get a wave for if you know what diastasis recti is? Yes. Okay. So we're all familiar. At least, cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, cool. So just kind of an, a brief overview since we're all on the same page. I'm going to try to share just one slide. We'll see if this is possible for me. Um, just so that I can pull up a picture. And if I can't figure it out in, in the next 30 seconds, we won't have to do this. Um, here we go. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So if we're talking about what is diastasis recti, the reason I really like this picture is because it shows that there are a bunch of different presentations of the same condition. Diastasis recti is just a separation, and don't worry about these words because they make it more complicated than it needs to be. Diastasis recti is a separation of your rectus abdominis, which is your six-pack muscle. So in this picture on the right, you can see the two six-pack muscles going up and down, and you can see what they consider to be normal or a closed diastasis recti. So no separation in the rectus abdominis in that top left picture. Then on the right and the bottom three pictures, you can see different versions of a separation of the rectus abdominis. It can be throughout the whole linea alba, so along that whole white line on the center of the belly. It can be just below the belly button, just above the belly button, throughout the entire abdomen. Now, all that this means, all that a diastasis recti really is, is weakness in the abdomen. It is extremely common. It happens typically during the second or third trimester in 100% of pregnancies, 
100% of pregnancies. Nobody gets out of pregnancy without developing a diastasis recti. And I think that that's really important to remember and to discuss because I see so many people who come to me saying, how do I prevent this from happening? And in reality, you cannot. The baby needs to go somewhere. The stomach needs to expand. Our bodies need to make room for a growing baby. And it's much better that it pushes forward than back into the spine, right? So there's nothing wrong or dangerous about a diastasis recti. Now, when it becomes meaningful is when it either continues postpartum and causes other symptoms along with the separation or when we start to notice certain changes during pregnancy. So what really matters about the diastasis is that it's a sign of weakness and it's a sign of weakness that that is, again, a, a normal change of pregnancy, but that we want to be aware of so that you don't continue stressing it. And there is a lot of research to show that there are things that you can do to prevent a worsening in diastasis recti. So it, can I get another way for how many of you know what coning is? 50-50, it looks like. So when we talk about diastasis recti, and since I know this group is pregnant, is early postpartum, some child, some birth workers were kind of spreading across the whole gamut. When we're talking about the diastasis recti during pregnancy and postpartum, we're looking for slightly different things, or at least we are focusing on slightly different things. During pregnancy, when that separation begins to occur, what you can start to see is something called coning. Coning is if you've ever, for those of you who are pregnant right now, if you've ever recently been pregnant, if you ever rolled up out of bed, got up off of the floor, and you notice your stomach do this, peak up in the middle of the belly. If you've ever watched a video of a pregnant person working out and noticed that down the center of their abdomen, there's a peak, that's called coning. Now there's another version of this called doming. People use them interchangeably. They're, they're very similar, but they're slightly different. Coning, when you see a shark fin, that's how it's typically described, going down the center of the belly, up and down, so this way, during movement, that's a sign that your rectus abdominis has separated, that your six pack muscles have separated, and that your muscles aren't doing their best job supporting the change in pressure occurring in the abdomen with that activity. So if you're doing a crunch and you see that shark fin, that's a sign that your abdominal muscles are too weak or not activating correctly to control that change in pressure. Now postpartum, you can continue to see coning or doming. Doming means a slightly less um, less kind of like apparent ridge and more of just like a poofing out of tissue. So if you've ever seen somebody like sit up and have their stomach kind of pooch out, that's more of a doming situation. Now, if you are exercising during pregnancy or postpartum and you notice coning, that does not mean that that, that exercise or the activity that you just did is inherently bad for you. Coning and doming, they're not signs that you're hurting yourself. They're signs that you're not doing the best job controlling that weakness. So all you want to do is change the way you're doing it, change the way you're activating your abdominal muscles, change your form with that movement, and then try again in a different way. Um, I talk to a lot of people who are terrified of, of that kind of change in shape, and I just like to point out that that's not necessarily a danger to you. It's, it's not a danger to you. It's just a sign that you have some weakness. Now, why does it matter? Now that I've gotten a little bit into the weeds, I'm going to bring myself back out. Why does it matter? Why do we care about diastasis recti? We care about it for a few reasons. Now, diastasis recti is associated with a number of symptoms. It's associated with mid-back pain. It's associated with weakness in the core, sensations and feelings of weakness. It's associated with a big one that a lot of people care about, aesthetic changes, as well as urinary incontinence, prolapse, hip pain. So again, this separation in the, in the rectus abdominis, in the core muscles, is a sign of weakness. And if you have weakness in your core, if you have weakness in the front wall of your body, all of the other muscles that support your core canister, which are your back muscles, your oblique, your pelvic floor, if you think of our core as a house, the abdomen is just the front wall. All of those other muscles, if you have weakness in that front wall, are going to have to work harder to compensate. And that's why we start to see things like leakage. That's why we start to see things like heaviness in the pelvis is a common symptom. Because you get the situation where 
where 25% of your core system, that front wall, isn't working to support you as well as it used to. So that's why we really care about diastasis recti, the fact that it can contribute to pain, to prolapse, to leakage, and that by treating and strengthening the core during pregnancy and postpartum, you can reduce those symptoms. Now, research has shown that if you work on core strength during pregnancy, core and pelvic core strength during pregnancy, you can reduce the likelihood of developing a lasting diastasis recti postpartum. Like I said earlier, 100% of people will develop it during pregnancy. We can't stop it and we don't want to stop it from happening during pregnancy. But about 75% of people will continue to have a diastasis postpartum and about 60% of people will still have one at six weeks postpartum. Those are the things that we really do want to address because that's lasting weakness that again can affect our pelvic floor, our back, the rest of our core system. Any questions on any of that so far? No? Didn't know that there was a difference between coning and doming and that's really interesting to me. Just that. Yeah, it's it's really mild. I mean, the difference is coning is just like that really sharp peak, right? Coning is a very um, coning is a very isolated experience, and it means that 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 central line of fascia it's called the linea alba. But when you look at an, an anatomical model and you see the six packs, usually they're separated by that white line. That's fascia. Coning is when the, the pressure being displaced is going straight through that linea alba, through that white line, through the rectus. So it's really specific. Doming is just a decreased or poor coordination of the core muscles as a whole that leads to kind of this like poofing. People, but again, people will use them interchangeably. But yeah, it is interesting that they're different. Um, there are a couple of risk factors for diastasis recti. And when I say risk factors for diastasis recti, I mean risk factors for the weakness continuing postpartum. And some of those include being less active during pregnancy, performing childcare, which is interesting, right? Childcare during pregnancy is a risk factor for diastasis, which I think is a terrible way of framing it. But basically what it's saying is if you're weak, and you're not staying active, and you're not working on core strengthening, and then you're lifting kids, and you're doing things at home, and you're, I mean, in, and you're performing just the normal tasks of parenthood, you're likely to develop this. And that's why I think it's such a problem that there's so much fear around this condition, because the fact that we're saying performing childcare is a risk factor really just means that parenthood is hard. We need to train for it and support pregnant people during pregnancy. And that in, just inherent to being pregnant and postpartum, your body is under stress. Um, so those are just other things to think about. I always tell people, it's not like, you don't have to be an athlete to need to train for pregnancy and postpartum recovery. Taking care of kids alone means that you're lifting whatever the weight of your child is, right? 10, 20, 30, 40 pounds. You keep lifting your kids as they get older. You cannot consider yourself not a weightlifter and yet be carrying around a 40 pound toddler for six hours a day, right? I know people that do that. So, um, so strengthening our core is not something that we want to reserve for people who are athletes. When it comes to um, when it comes to checking yourself for a diastasis recti, how many of you are familiar with how to check yourself for a diastasis? Ish, I'm seeing ish. Um, I'm not going to ask you all to lay down on the floor with me to do this, but I do want to I'm going to talk you and walk you through how to do it. So the way that you check yourself for a diastasis, and I'm also going to walk you through what you're looking for because it's not just about the width of the gap. So the way you check yourself for this is you lay down on your back with your knees bent. And I'm gonna point the camera down at my belly because that's really what matters here. So you lay down on your back with your knees bent. You take two fingers, just like this, maybe three, depending. And you start by just kind of feeling down the center of the belly. It's really hard to feel sitting, but this is the technique, right? You start just laying down, your head and shoulders are resting, and you feel down the center of the belly. Now, the next thing you do, is you just lift your head and your shoulder blades off of the floor. And I'm actually, I'm gonna walk you through it on the ground because that's gonna make a lot more sense. Uh, okay, so you start by laying down. First, you just feel down your central belly. Can you guys still hear me okay? Cool. Then all you do is you lift your head and your shoulder blades off the mat. You take those same two fingers, you start up at the sternum, down the center of the belly, and you feel down the central line, down to the belly button, 
down all the way to the pubic symphysis. So you feel all the way down the belly. What you're looking for is, is there a separation? Can your fingers sink into any separation down the central line? The next thing you're looking for is how deep is it? Is it really shallow when you feel, does it, do you hit a hard wall and kind of bounce off or can you sink in? Does it feel like it goes forever? And the last thing you're looking for is coning. So when you lift your head, and if you look at my stomach, when I lift my head, things stay pretty neutral, right? They stay the same shape. If you lift your head and you see this happen, that's called distortion, that's coning. So that's how we know that there's weakness down that central line. So where people go wrong really frequently when they're checking themselves for a diastasis recti is they'll only look at the width. And the width is just one part of the picture. What really matters more arguably is the depth of the separation as well as the distortion. Do things stay flat or do they poof up? Those are the things that give us an idea of what's the strength of the muscles underneath that rectus abdominis. Because again, the separation of the rectus isn't necessarily the problem. It's your body's ability to control that pressure change. And that's what comes from muscle and fascial strength. And that's what you check for by width and by distortion, by change in shape of the tissue. Um, now, how you apply that to movement. So how do you know if an exercise is right or wrong for you? How do you know if something that you're doing around the house is too difficult for you? Now, one thing that you can do is if you are exercising or if you're carrying things around the house, you can actually check that diastasis before and after a movement to see if it changes. If a movement is not ideal for you in the moment, if you're doing crunches and your body isn't prepared to support you through crunches, you will actually see a meaningful change in the size or the width or the shape of your diastasis immediately after that activity. That does not mean you hurt yourself. You're not injuring yourself by doing this, but that separation will change throughout the day depending on how fatigued the muscle is, on how stressed the muscle is. Um, does that make sense? Anybody have questions about any of that? Okay, um, so switching gears a little bit, because I know I only have a few minutes left, so switching gears a little bit into movement and exercise for diastasis. I want to talk about it from the perspective of pregnancy and postpartum, since we're kind of across the spectrum right now. When it comes to strengthening the core during pregnancy, being mindful of a diastasis recti during pregnancy. For those of you who do notice coning, for those of you who do feel weakness in the core, or for those of you who've been avoiding core strengthening altogether, there are things you wanna modify in the way that you move during pregnancy to support your core, and then there are exercises that you wanna consider. Things that you wanna modify during pregnancy are the way you're getting out of bed. Most people will stop crunching straight up out of bed and sitting straight up because they can't at a certain point. I would argue that you want to switch to that log roll, to that technique where you're rolling onto your side and pushing yourself up sooner rather than later because of the stress on that same separation. So one way that you can modify is by log rolling. Another way that you can modify is by changing the way that you're exercising. So we do still wanna strengthen the core during pregnancy. However, most of us know core strength in the, in the way of crunching and planking. Now, postpartum, there's nothing inherently wrong with crunching and planking for a diastasis recti. Some people shouldn't be doing it. Some people can be doing it. There's a lot of gray area in this. But during pregnancy, avoiding that, that flexion, that trunk flexion, can be really important for not unnecessarily stressing that fascia and that separation. So during pregnancy, what I recommend is working the deep core, working the deep core in various positions. And I know that that's kind of vague, but that's because that can mean so many things. If you go ahead and look on my Instagram or my blog, I have so many versions of deep core strengthening that don't, avoid, uh, that don't include flexion, but it is really important to still work on core strengthening during pregnancy. Now, postpartum, you want to continue using that log roll, so not crunching straight out of bed, but instead of using your arms to help you up and down, particularly in the early days. But you also want to slowly start returning and strengthening in the ways that you used to work out. So if you used to crunch, if you used to plank, those are no longer movements that you 100% need to avoid. They're just movements that you want to be mindful during. So you can check yourself, again, for your diastasis before and after a movement, before and after an exercise program. And you can watch yourself for coning or doming when you're doing any sort of movement to help yourself determine is this a good fit or is this a bad fit for me in this moment not forever 
Um, and I think that it's also really important to remember that these things can change. What's good for you or wrong for you at six weeks postpartum is going to be different than than at 12 weeks postpartum, than at one year postpartum. So if you were told not to crunch at three, four, five, six weeks postpartum, and here you are 14 months later, and you're still avoiding that like the plague, it might be time to start considering, well, why was I avoiding it in the beginning? And how can I start working that back into my life? Because again, even if you're not doing 100 steps a day, you're probably crunching in and out of bed. You're probably sitting up off the floor holding a baby. Um, so a lot of these, a lot of these exercises are based in what we need for strength as parents and they're, they're meant to be functional. So, um, so I guess my, my, my thesis statement in all of this is going to be that strengthening the core during pregnancy is really important. Strengthening the core postpartum is really important. And then a diastasis recti, whether you have it, whether it's four finger width, whether it's one finger width is not a danger to you. It's not something that you need to be fearful of. It's not something that you need to avoid altogether. And if you have this weakness, strengthening is one of the most effective ways to address it. Anybody have any questions? I see one in the chat. Um, this is, does the degree of weakness caused by diastasis recti impact a woman's ability to labor effectively? So the degree of diastasis recti during pregnancy, there are, you know, we do need to be able to coordinate our core muscles to effectively push. However, I think that it's kind of a, a, a myth, and Ashley, I'd be interested to hear your opinion on this too. I think it's a myth that we need to be strong in our core and in our pelvic floor for labor. For instance, the pelvic floor's job during labor is to get out of the way. You want the pelvic floor to let the baby descend. But the way that we generate pressure during labor to effectively push. Yes, our abdominal muscles play a role, but it's much more about our breath and our diaphragm control and our positioning than it is our core strength. So in short, no, I don't believe that the degree of weakness caused by diastasis recti can negatively impact somebody's ability to labor. However, I do think that global weakness can make labor more difficult because labor is an extremely physical experience. I agree with that 100% add to it that I think it can actually go the other way where sometimes really aggressive pushing can make a diastasis much worse postpartum or much more severe postpartum. So like I'm teaching the birth murder push prep class tomorrow and we teach that class every month and it's all about posture and alignment and breath and pelvic floor release to get ready for pushing to let the body be optimized to get into a place where the baby's going to come out because that's what babies do. Like people who have been pregnant in comas successfully give birth because the physiology behind childbirth makes sense. What we do most commonly in hospitals here is tweak that process a little bit and often not for the better where we put birthing people on their back or lay them flat in some way or restrict their movement in some way so that we're pushing a baby like uphill over the tailbone or we're spreading their legs really wide which is closing like creating less space between uh, the sits bones and the pelvic outlet and so when you put someone in those environments you the current medical system asks of us to create more intra-abdominal pressure to help the baby get out. But that's not a fundamental component to childbirth. That's like the workaround that we have right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree with all of that. I think the other thing that's interesting is that what I see really frequently is people who are really strong throughout pregnancy and actually develop pelvic floor and abdominal muscle tension. And what they struggle with is releasing and opening during pregnancy, which has also been shown to stall the second stage of labor and even potentially contribute to progression to C-section. So I completely agree with everything Ashley said. And Frequently when I take people through birth preparation for the pelvic floor and the core, it's much more about re relaxation and opening and breathing. Core strengthening during pregnancy is really important for postpartum recovery, for the reduction in, in leakage and prolapse, but not necessarily for birth. Um, I see another question here. Should I be working out every day for it to heal in three months postpartum and haven't been very active? So I think that 
When, when I see people for diastasis recti postpartum, say you're three months, you come into the office, you say, hey, I've had this diastasis recti, I feel really weak and it hasn't gotten better in the past few months. So I think that there's this, this is expectation that I'm going to send somebody home with a 45 minute core strengthening program that they need to do every day. In reality, when it comes to a diastasis postpartum, depending on the severity, depending on your level of activity, depending on a whole lot of things, oftentimes what can really help is altering our breath, our movement patterns that we're already doing naturally throughout the day to contribute to healing. Now, what I will typically do is give people three exercises that will take them 10 minutes that I want them to do every day. And then I'll also teach them ways that they can alter the way they're breastfeeding or the way that they're the way that they're carrying their baby the way that they're that they're rocking their baby to sleep in order to work on core strengthening so should you be working out every day i think that it's unfair to expect a new parent to be exercising every day i think that there is you know there's sleep deprivation and there is nutrition deficit and there's so many factors at that stage in postpartum recovery but i think that figuring out ways to alter what you're already doing so that you're not taking time away from yourself, but rather using your activities that you're already participating in more effectively can be really helpful. Um, any follow-up on that? I would just direct people to obviously doing virtual consultations with you. And we talked about that where when it's like strict PT, then your license sure is stricter by state. But like when you're doing these like movement consultations with people, you can work with folks virtually anywhere, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's definitely a very good point. I think that for somebody who is struggling to figure out where to go with their healing, checking in with a PT that you can see virtually, which I do do virtual visits and you're absolutely right, Ashley, this would kind of fall under the realm of wellness. So these are, these are the types of things that I can do with you regardless of where you live. Whereas if you were saying, Hey, I'm in a lot of pain. Hey, I have this problem. I have leakage. That would be something that I would say you need medical care for. Um, but checking in with somebody who can give you a personalized program that you can use from your day to day, -to -day can make a big difference for diastasis recti healing. And then the only other thing I was going to add to that was we did a conversation with someone named Zoe Boick Levine, and that's called Stop Exercising and Find Your Strength. And it's on the YouTube channel. And she talks a lot about that, just tweaking everyday movement, um, how you're getting up and getting down from the floor when you're with your baby. So that's just like another free way to get some information about it too. That's a really great topic. That's amazing. Um, okay. How about starting to strengthen core after C-section? When can we start exercising to correct a DRA? So as far as C-section recovery and as far as, let's actually start with the second part of that question. So when can you start exercising to address a diastasis postpartum? Exercising has taken on a meaning in our, in our culture of meaning that you are, you're sweating, you're in the gym, you're working really hard. You can start doing exercises to heal a diastasis recti and to regain strength in your core as early as one to two days, one to two days postpartum, assuming that you are medically safe, whether you had a vaginal or a cesarean birth, because the foundational beginnings of healing a diastasis recti start with breathing. Start with really gentle core activation to teach you how to intentionally engage muscles that your brain's never had to think of before. It's very, very gentle when we start with the foundations. I will see people as early as their first week postpartum to start working on that breath work, to start working on that gentle re-engagement. You are not exercising. It's not what you expect exercise to be. Frequently, people get very frustrated with me because I have them on their back breathing for a long time, but that's where you really need to start. So one to two days, assuming that you have appropriate guidance and you know how to do this correctly. Now, what, how about strengthening your core after a C-section specifically? Some of the biggest things for C-section recovery center around C-section scar massage and getting the core moving and expanding. Most people do need core strengthening postpartum. I've yet to find somebody who comes out of pregnancy and childbirth with an exceptionally strong core. I will eat my words when I see that happen. But when it comes to a cesarean birth in particular, although this can also happen for vaginal births, our muscles tend to get very 
very tight around the scar. Scar tissue doesn't get as much blood flow as the rest of our tissue, so the scar itself tends to not move very well. And where you actually want to begin around five to six weeks postpartum is abdominal massage and getting that scar moving. And that can be particularly important for people who had an emergency C-section or who had a traumatic birth experience, because those folks most frequently feel uncomfortable touching their scar feel uncomfortable thinking about their scar, feel uncomfortable looking at their scar, which leads to the muscles surrounding the scar and the connective tissue surrounding the scar tightening to protect the area. And that will make it very difficult to rehab core strength if your muscles are already starting in this really tight protected space. Um, so you can start on diastasis recti healing day one, whether you have a vaginal birth or a, or a cesarean birth, but I would also consider mobility and relaxation and massage for a cesarean recovery. Um, I plan to see a pelvic floor PT when I'm six weeks postpartum. What should I expect during the visit? That's a really good question. So when you see a pelvic floor physical therapist, if you've ever been to a physical therapist, the visit is not necessarily very different. There are just some, some caveats. Every pelvic floor physical therapy initial evaluation, regardless of whether you're pregnant, two days postpartum or six weeks postpartum, will start with you talking to your therapist. They will ask you questions. They'll ask you to tell them your story. They might ask about your birth experience. They might ask about your bladder, your bowel, your sexual health, any pain that you're experiencing. You never have to answer questions that you're uncomfortable answering, and you can always ask your therapist why they're asking certain things things. After that portion of the exam, which in my appointments usually takes anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes, they will tell you what they want to physically evaluate. At six weeks postpartum, what they're most likely to evaluate from the get-go, or they're, they're most likely to want to evaluate, is checking you for a diastasis recti, checking the muscle tone in your abdomen. If you had a cesarean birth, checking your C-section scar mobility, and then a pelvic floor exam, either externally or internally, depending on your comfort level. A pelvic floor exam can mean an internal vaginal exam. It can mean an internal rectal exam. It can mean an external exam over your pants if you're uncomfortable with that in any way. Um, checking those things is going to allow them to get a good idea of how your core canister, your pelvic floor, your abdomen, how those muscles are working together and where your strength is. From that point, they'll provide you with exercises that you can do at home. It's called a home exercise program. Most PTs will send you home with a home exercise program that might be five minutes a day, might be 30 minutes a day, depending on you and what you want and what fits your schedule. And then you'll work on that until your next appointment. PT is generally a combination of hands-on manual therapy and exercise-based instruction. Um, can a diastasis recti cause a bump above the belly button? I actually had this before pregnancy, but it is not bigger after my pregnancy. Is there a way to tell if it's from a diastasis or a hernia? The only way to tell if it's a diastasis or a hernia is going to be is going to be either a man. Oh, it's bigger. It's I figured that you meant bigger. Um, it could very well be an umbilical hernia. Lots of people have umbilical hernias prior to pregnancy. Lots of people have them postpartum. I will say that conservatively, when you're talking about pelvic floor physical therapy, an abdominal hernia and diastasis recti is treated very similarly. The goal is to strengthen the muscles surrounding the weakness, whether the weakness is a diastasis recti, whether the weakness is a hernia. Hernias are sometimes more tender than a diastasis recti, so that's one way that your, your MD might make a, dis a distinction between what it is. They may also want to do an ultrasound. Um, regardless of which one it is, like I said, core strengthening should be helpful. When I will typically refer somebody out for an abdominal hernia or an umbilical hernia is if it's really tender, it's not getting better with exercise, it's feeling worse with movement and with strengthening, but, but it very well could be. Um, can you recommend any resources regarding abdominal massage for cesareans? That's a good question. Ashley, do you have any research or any resources for abdominal massage postpartum? I do actually, I'd be happy to include them in the follow-up to this email. And then I guess for folks on the recording, I'm not sure how to access it, but um, Lindsay Vestal, who's an OT that we work with, sometimes she's at the functional pelvis. She um, made a scar tissue massage instruction video that I refer clients to. Well, I also, um, my Instagram has a couple cesarean scar massage videos made by other PTs that are really good. So if you look through the archives of the Ladybird PT Instagram, they'll also live there. I'm going to talk through it just a little bit um, to have it on this recording too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
So regarding abdominal massage for cesareans, there are two different factors, right? One is general abdominal massage where you're working on the muscles surrounding the connective tissue surrounding the scar in the abdomen. The other is scar massage itself. Depending on where you are in your postpartum recovery, you can generally start some gentle abdominal massage as early as four or five weeks, you probably don't want to start scar massage until six-ish weeks, assuming everything is healed. Your physician will give you clearance or your midwife will give you clearance, at typically around six weeks postpartum. When you're doing general abdominal massage, part of the goal is just desensitization, getting your stomach used to touch, figuring out what feels tender and working there. So you can work throughout the whole belly in these sweeping motions, it can also help with constipation and bowel movements if you're experiencing either any of that. You wanna use a little bit of lotion and a little bit of pressure. You're just looking for areas that feel tender and moving throughout the belly. Other techniques that I'll have people use and I'll actually just show you because it'll be easier than explaining it. So some techniques that I'll have people use, if you look at my belly, is I will do a couple things. One that I'll start with is upward stroking. So the way that you do that is you start down at your hip bone with a little bit of lotion on the belly, and you stroke up towards the belly button, maybe five, 10 times. Then you go down to the pubic bone, stroke up to the belly button five or 10 times. Then to the right hip bone, stroke up towards the belly button five or 10 times, using enough pressure that you're getting into resistance and you're feeling some tender spots, but certainly not hurting yourself. Oh no, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure where this ringing is coming from. Sorry, y'all. Let me find my phone. Okay, um, so upward stroking is one technique. The other technique that I would recommend is massage around the belly button. So we'll start to the left of the belly button and just do little circles with both fingers like this. Then we'll go below and do little circles below the belly button, then to the right and then to the top. Those are some gentle abdominal massage techniques that I would recommend. We're talking about the scar itself if we act like this pant line is my scar, you want to start by going up and down, again, using a little bit of lotion, a little bit of pressure, up and down throughout the whole scar. Then you want to start by going in circles along the whole scar, all the way from side to side in both directions. And then the last technique that's pretty easy to do is just push up and down. You're not twisting, but you're just applying some friction in opposite directions throughout the whole scar. Now there are other techniques where you can pinch and lift, which for some people is an important thing to, to incorporate, but that's something that I would consider further down the road, definitely not around six to eight weeks postpartum. I don't see any other questions. Um, I'm, some might come in. If you have other questions, ask them. Uh, the, my thought or my, my question, I guess, <laughs> that I can voice is um, we talked about it a little bit. Like I could probably pull it out of what you were talking about, but if you could just make really clear, like what are one or two or three of the biggest myths around diastasis? Like what are the things that you hear that you're like, oh no, I really, that's like, I wish people would stop saying that. Yeah. Um, one is that you can prevent it. I really think like, I talk to so many people who feel like I did this to myself, this is my fault, if only I hadn't done this thing during pregnancy. And in reality, that is a big load of BS. You cannot prevent it from happening. It happens in 100% of people, so that's one. Two, I think is that you will never be able to crunch or plank again, or that crunching and planking is bad for a diastasis recti. When it comes to core strengthening, there are no exercises that are inherently bad or good for a diastasis recti. You will see lots of lists online that will say, try, this is a great exercise for diastasis, core recovery for diastasis. I have made these lists, these exercises exist, but what the fact remains that there is no one set of exercises that will serve everybody. And if you look at any of my lists for diastasis recti exercises, they will say, try these, they might not be for you. So any sort of program that provides the same set of, of work for any number of thousands of people will work for some and not work for others. And if it doesn't work for you, that does not mean that your diastasis can't heal. 
Um, and I think that the third one is that the goal is closing the gap. I talk to a lot of people who just want to close the gap. They want their rectus abdominis to come back together. And I understand there is a lot of pressure for bounce back culture, or there's a lot of pressure for people to look a certain way. But we cannot necessarily guarantee that your diastasis will close. However, having a diastasis does not mean that you will stay weak. And I think that that's a really important distinction. You can have a, a separation in your rectus abdominis and be really, really strong and get back to all of the things you want to be doing. Um, I think those would be my top three. And for those of you who are like, what does it mean to be strong and have a big separation? Look at, I'm gonna put it into the chat. I think that this is her name on Instagram. Look at this person, Mummy Fitness. It's M-U-M-M-Y-F-I-T-N-E-S-S. I'm like 95% sure that's her name. She has a pretty large separation and she can kick ass with core strengthening. She does crunches. She does everything you would think that you could never do with the separation. And it's a really, really good demonstration of the fact that having a diastasis does not mean that you're going to be impaired forever. And I think that I just saw another question. Will it get bigger with each pregnancy? If left to its own devices with absolutely no intervention, maybe. Maybe, I mean, diastasis, a risk factor for diastasis is multiple pregnancies. So if you do nothing between pregnancies to, to strengthen the core, and if you do no core strengthening during pregnancy, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Every pregnancy is so different. And to be fair, you can do all of the core strengthening and still have a larger diastasis postpartum. We don't have a ton of research on on this sort of stuff. We don't have a ton of research on the change with each subsequent pregnancy, but you do definitely see a trending for a larger, a wider, a deeper separation with subsequent pregnancies if you're not doing anything in between them. Um, I'm changing your Instagram. Underscore. Mummy underscore fitness. Yeah. Um, those were, I like those three. I would agree with those. Um, and what was my other question? I just lost it looking at Instagram. That's I know, I'm sorry. It's a rough place to direct people in the middle of a talk. Um, my other question, mm, no, it's gone. <laughs> I think it was just a statement. I think it was like in, um, to emphasize what you were saying that I didn't have a diastasis, like a, a severe diastasis postpartum, um, with my kids, but I did have some pelvic floor issues. And the thing that everybody who's like in the birth smarter classes or, or support groups, I think knows us already, but, um, our big idea is that this time is a pregnant opportunity. Like we toss that around and we're just like, what I have felt in my body and what I want everybody else to feel is like having pelvic floor issues was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because it made me learn how my body worked and then do this deep core healing that I likely never would have done. I would have continued operating without really understanding what my goals were. Um, and so I feel like I'm much more function, like I have a much more functional body now than I did before I got pregnant. Um, and it's been like a very, like, I'm going to do all of my exercise. I'm not going to do any exercise. Like it's been a very jumpy journey. Um, yes. I think is what happens with parents and maybe anybody. Um, but I'm like definitely better off because of it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. We put a lot of emphasis on recovery postpartum, but I speak to a lot of people who say that they feel stronger following their, their pregnancy and their, their postpartum recovery than they did before. And even athletes, because we just, we don't think to train our deep core, our pelvic floor prior to pregnancy, but leakage is common in, in athletes who've never been pregnant. Leakage is common in middle school and in high school athletes. A lot, I talked to a lot of people who were like, this problem did not start with pregnancy. Um, or I had a diastasis before pregnancy. And so I think that that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, you got one more question in. If you are working out and notice coning and you attempt to adjust it and still notice coning, should you stop and avoid that exercise? I assume yeah. that maybe both. 
Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, you should modify that exercise. You never, you rarely need to avoid a movement altogether. But for instance, if planking causes coning in a low plank down on elbows, what if you do the same thing in a high plank? What if you plank on your knees? What if you plank on an elevated surface? I would say that you want to modify that exercise until you find the version that fits your body best. So I don't think that you, I think it's rare that you need to fully avoid a movement. I think it's rare that the movement's just so wrong for you that there's no variation of it that you can do. Even something really dynamic like toes to bar, there are so many ways to modify it. But if you are trying to modify it without, if you're trying to approach it with a different kind of like um, form and you're still noticing it, then I would modify rather than continuing. But that's a great question. Yeah, I really like those suggestions. Do you have any programs that you do recommend for people beyond? And like, in my mind, everybody should be doing a one-on-one -on -one appointment from like the rehab perspective, because like you're saying, no, no 12 week program or no, anything is going to know what's happening in that person's body with that birth story and their body history. Right. But beyond that, are there things you recommend to folks after you see them? Yeah, I mean, it, if we're talking about after I see them, frequently I'll discharge people into the arms of some program that they're interested in doing. And that can be a birth fit program, that can be the mood to program, that can be, um, what are the other ones? There's street parking, I think, has a good postpartum program. I actually, I just wrote an ebook about postpartum recovery with a personal trainer in Austin that's launching tomorrow. And it's a six week postpartum recovery program. And it, it's meant to take people through the types of movement, particularly for those who are feeling good, but just wondering how to reintegrate movement. It's very gentle and it's very scalable. So now I'm, I'm happy to be able to recommend that because I've been looking for a resource like this for a long time. But I think that in reality, what somebody should kind of be graduating into is gonna vary really wildly from person to person, depending on, are you a runner? Are you a weightlifter? What are your goals? What do you wanna get back to doing? Um, and I, I would, I hope that once they're done with physical therapy, when somebody is done with physical therapy or meets with a physical therapist, they have a better idea of kind of where, where they are and where their gauge is. But programs like Birth Fit or Fit for Mom is another program that exists typically in a lot of different locations. I don't know if it's in every city, but it's in a lot of cities. Um, or even pre and postnatal yoga. Yoga instructors are usually a really good resource on stuff like this too. Yeah. Cool. I would add Chelsea method to that. Would there are a newer New York based PT and that's a 12 week program. Um, I'll connect you guys. They're very lovely. Yeah, that'd be great. I really like it. I um, mean, it's very interactive. So you can sort of pick where you're at in their program. It's not very prescriptive. Mm -hmm. Um, and then home body movement is another one. And we have another YouTube video, especially for folks who are postpartum um, with Amy from home body movement on br breathing after childbirth and just how to get back into that. Um, so that's like a nice compliment to this conversation. Um, yeah, I think that's a helpful list for people to start digging through resources. I'll have to look at those resources. I'm not familiar with both of those. Yeah. Um, Amazing. Any other thoughts or questions from folks who are here? Does anybody can also stop the recording if you want me to, and then you can unmute and just unload on us. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. <laughs> okay. So if you are pregnant, the last thing I'll say in the recording is if you are pregnant and you're interested in some of them, I agree with Rebecca that we can't prevent a diastasis, but in particular, as it relates to pushing, um, the birth smarter push prep class is, is really solid. I'm biased, but, um, I think it makes sense to get the posture alignment, breathing coordination down when you're pregnant. Um, and we're probably just going to refer you to PT. So you could just do it that way too, but it's nice to learn in a group environment and hear other people's questions. Um, can you share the postpartum exercise programs? I will put all of that into an email, a follow-up email for you guys. Um, and then thank Rebecca for the recording. Stop the, stop it. And then we can just chat with who's left. Um,